the heck was that? <laughs> it came like that? You're eight years old, exploring Dead Man's Creek behind Old Man Spankenberg's house. Everyone knows you don't go into that old red barn, but something catches your eye. In the corner, you notice a shape under a fraying canvas tarp. You pull the sheet, and as the dust settles, you discover the most beautifully weird car you've ever friggin' seen. What is this? How did it get here? This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Dodge Daytona and the Plymouth Superbird. In 1968, NASCAR was a big deal, and Dodge was getting their butt kicked by Ford and struggling to keep up with their sister company, Plymouth. It was pretty embarrassing. It's completely humiliating. So the order came from the very top. Build a car that can win and do whatever it takes. The first try was a modified Charger. The 68 Charger is an icon, probably top five best looking American cars ever, but it was a crummy race car. The wide ass grill trapped in a bunch of air and the flying buttresses created a vacuum that sucked the car upward, making it impossible to drive at high speed. To fix this, Dodge fitted the Charger with the grill from the core and made the rear window flush with the B-pillars. The result was the Charger 500, a much smoother car that could actually handle at high speed. But it wasn't enough to win, as Ford had also been perfecting their own stock car, the Grand Torino, named after Clint Eastwood. When the Charger and Torino met at Daytona, Ford went home with the win. Dodge was f***ing Pissed. To add insult to injury, Plymouth star driver Richard Petty was tired of driving such a crummy race car and left for Ford, promptly winning the first race of 1969. The pressure was on Dodge to save face and lure Petty back to the team. Dodge engineers whipped up a radical concept with a pointy nose and a big ass wing. They sent the sketch to Dodge general manager Rob McCurry and he said it was the ugliest car he had ever seen. But he followed it up with, will it win races? I gotta win NASCAR or I'm gonna get freaking fired. The Charger Daytona was a go. Dodge even brought in a guy from Chrysler's missile division to work on the Daytona project. Wait, what? Chrysler had a missile division? What the frick? Yeah, dude. Chrysler built ballistic missiles for the government. Missiles designed by Nazi scientists that we brought over here after World War II. It was called Operation Paperclip. It's a real thing happened. Google it. <laughs> Back to the car. John Pointer was a literal rocket scientist. Chrysler thought that building the Daytona was more important than the Cold War. That's what I call having your priorities in order. Dodge took their winged beast to the Chelsea Proving Grounds for some testing. But when the drivers got to the track, Dodge engineers gave them specific instructions not to go over 190 miles an hour. Here's why they couldn't do that. Ford had spy planes circling the track. This is weird, right? I mean, Chrysler had a missile division and Ford had spy planes. What a time to be alive! Dodge driver Charlie Glotzbach drove the Daytona to 204 miles an hour. The first NASCAR to break the 200 mile an hour mark. The team kept the top speed a secret. No one outside of Chrysler's engineering staff or upper management knew how fast their car really was. The Daytona made its public debut on September 14th, 1969 at the Alabama International Speedway, AKA the house that Ricky Bobby built. Well, Dak, here's the deal. I'm the best there is, plain and simple. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I piss excellence. The Daytona took pole position with ease and claimed victory the next day. Ford and Chevy had no idea what hit them. What just hit us? Dude, I have no idea what just hit us. Why have we been fighting this whole time? You're actually pretty cool. No, oh, but we're rivals and then they pretended to hate each other. The Daytona then won seven out of the last 10 races of the 1969 season. It was clear their hard work had paid off. The pointy nose cut through the air better than anything else on the track. And that insane wing gave it insane grip. And those little scoops on the fenders weren't just for looks, babe. Dodge told NASCAR they were for wheel clearance at high speeds. But what the vents really did was relieve air pressure that built up under the car, keeping it glued to the track. Oh, and about that wing. The wing was so big because it needed to be in the clean air. John Pointer, our rocket scientist from before, remember, he knew that the already swirling air just above the tail would have less contrasting forces. So he put the wing up high 
where it could produce significantly more downforce to the rear wheels. Also, for the Daytona to be legal to race, Dodge had to build 500 production models for the public to buy. On Sunday, you could watch the craziest looking race car ever destroy the competition, then go buy the same car on Monday. That's marketing, baby! But it really didn't work. Dealers had a really, really hard time selling the Daytona. It was weird looking, and the nose made engine overheating a real problem. It got even harder the next year when NASCAR rules said 1,500 cars had to be delivered to dealers. That's three times as many. The next season, Plymouth brought to life a winged car of their own, the Superbird. <laughs> And even though both the Tona and the Bird look pretty similar, there are some subtle differences betwixt them. You gotta be a real connoisseur of winged, pointy-nosed NASCAR cars to know. For one, Plymouth designers really didn't like the idea of putting a big nose on their prized Roadrunner, and only agreed to do it if they could make it look better. The nose was reshaped and the wing was placed further up on the trunk. These changes made the Superbird around three miles per hour slower than the Daytona. And after 200 laps, I'm gonna be honest with you, that makes a pretty big difference. <laughs> but that didn't stop Richard Petty from returning to Plymouth for the 1970s season in his signature Petty Blue paint scheme. Well, well, well. We finally have a good car, and now suddenly Richie's interested? I see how it is, dick. Now, we have two race cars with giant wings that people would buy at the dealership. Am I the only one who sees how fucking crazy this is? Chrysler wanted to win NASCAR so bad that they made 3,000 cars that will only be sold to two guys, Joe Dirt and Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused. Actually, if you think about it, I'm sort of a mix between Joe Dirt and Matthew McConaughey from Dazed and Confused. Dads? The 1970 season was freaking dominated by Chrysler's Aero car. The Daytona and Superbird won 33 out of 48 races that season, but their supremacy was short lived. For the 1971 season, NASCAR rules mandated that any Aero car couldn't have an engine bigger than 300 cubic inches. The fuck? The rule killed the Daytona and Superbird overnight. NASCAR officials said they were concerned with the crazy high speeds these cars could achieve. Oh, come on, NASCAR! I thought that we we're here to race. That's not the real reason. How about you be honest? I, no, no, I'm good. I've only had one drink. Today, the Daytona and Superbird live on as legendary muscle cars, outlandish survivors from a time before stock cars became shapeless blobs with painted on headlights. Maybe someday NASCAR will put the stock back in stock car racing. But until then, I'll be fantasizing about having a Daytona of my own. Oh, and if anyone from NASCAR is watching, please add more road courses to the calendar. Thanks. So there it is. Everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Dodge Daytona and Plymouth Superbird. We're gonna move beyond cars. We're gonna start doing tracks, rivalries, racing series, designers, drivers, etc. What do you wanna see on future episodes of Up to Speed? Donut is a family. Donut is a channel. Donut wants the support of its fans on every show that we do. Please help us be a success. You guys are the best. As always, like, subscribe, comment, share. I love you. I'm sorry. I like you a lot and maybe someday I will love you, but listen, I don't know where I am right now. Right now I'm focusing on just making these videos. That's me right now and I don't want to hurt you, but I don't want to lose you. Okay, I love you. Will you marry me?